Hello. Welcome to our webinar today, Equity Matters Everywhere in Healthcare. I'm Lisa Silverman. I'm your ex-client education specialist, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. It is so good to have so many of you here. We have 142 people here. So welcome. Um, if you're already doing it, please take a minute to introduce yourself in the chat box. If you haven't yet done so, tell us what organization you're with. Um, ideally, tell us what state you're with. I'm going to see don't think we can cover it all 50 states, but I'm betting we can go over 35 today. Um, tell us what organization you're with. We know many of you know UREC. We're going to ask about your relationship to UREC in just a minute. Um, if you're having technical issues, message Nick Davis. He's around. He's here to help. Just chat it in. Um, and as I mentioned, we are recording this webinar, and you'll get the link to the recording. Our goal is to get it out to you on Monday, and you should feel free to share that recording widely with anyone in your organization who didn't join us today. I want to introduce today's speakers. They're going to come on camera as their section allows. Uh, Michael Garrett is with our UREC Health Equity Committee. So is Lawrence Haynes. Michael is a health equity and clinical and case management consultant. He's got a background in case management. Lawrence comes to us from the American Public Health Association. They were an essential partner in developing our new health equity accreditation. Um, he's great. You'll hear him give some context for health equity and what it is. So if it's a little bit new to you, he's there to make sure we're all the same page. So it's Michael. Um, we've got Jen Richards with me. She's our Senior Director of Product Development and Deanna Harden, who's your Business Development Contact here for all things health equity at URAC. To get started, I want to talk a little bit about URAC. Um, so we, we were founded in 1990 and we've grown significantly into many areas of healthcare since our inception. So we're strong believers in growth and improvement but we're also strong believers in excellence through innovation. So this is why our programs are developed to fit multiple types of organizations, even within a single industry. We also know that we cannot promote quality healthcare without the help of other people, other organizations who really just help us understand the market, understand best practices. And we have so many great organizations that we get to work with all the time. Um, as we either develop or revise our programs or even just organizations who sit on our advisory groups and help us understand the market a little bit deeper. Uh, so the ones you're seeing here on this slide are our partners in multiple different areas. They help us with multiple different programs and all over healthcare. Um, as we dive into the next slide, you'll see that even within health equity, we did create a very specific committee to help us gain some insight. So when we were looking to create a new program, it really is essential for us to know the industry, to get to know that industry, to get to know the perspectives of organizations who are actively doing the work. And so we, we create committees or councils to help us understand different aspects um, the organizations you see on this slide were instrumental in helping us develop the health equity program specifically. So we started this journey really through a partnership with the National Minority Quality Forum and MQF. You'll see them right in the center of this slide. Um, and they connected us with so many other organizations who were and still are thinking about health equity and strategies. And they helped us understand those, those goals and those initiatives and what's really important to prioritizing health equity within the healthcare space. So we are definitely grateful to those who continue to serve on this council. It was such a successful committee that we decided to make it permanent. Um, and so we have many, many of these people sitting on a standing advisory council now that will continue to help us understand health equity. Um, and really it's because of our connection with NMQF that we've really been able to integrate into this, this area. Um, so speaking of those who sit on this council, um, we have both Michael Garrett and Lawrence um, who will come to speak to us. Um, I'm gonna actually pass it over to Michael first who's been with URAC for many, many years, since 1992. Um, he's helped us with many different areas. Um, and so Michael, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself and take it from here. 
Great, thanks. <clears throat> and first of all, thank you for the opportunity to uh, join this uh, webinar. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I've been involved with URAC for many years. Uh, I've sat on the Clinical Accreditation Committee. I've served as a chair for a while. I'm now on the Health Standards Committee and also uh, on the Health Equity Council, which has been a great opportunity. I also just want to, again, emphasize uh, the National Minority Quality Forum was a great partner in developing these standards. And if you don't follow them, uh, I would strongly suggest that you do. They have some great resources, free webinars, physician papers, and so forth. Um, they brought great expertise to the table. Um, and also, um, I am affiliated with the Case Management uh, Society of America. I actually serve as the chair of the DEIB and Health Equity Council um, currently. And so I'm kind of all in in terms of uh, DEI and, and health equity. Go to the next slide. So one of the uh, important things to understand, um, for some, health equity is a newer concept. Um, although, um, of course, crossing the quality chasm over 20 years ago, um, the National Academy of Medicine identified that um, equity was one of the six aims of a high quality, high functioning uh, health system. Uh, and so uh, it feels like finally we're uh, ad addressing this issue around health equity in a variety of different settings, whether you're a health plan, a health system, a clinic, a digital health, digital health solution, or what have you. Um, and in order to understand health equity, there are many terms and concepts to understand. And these were just a few things like cultural competency, cultural humility, intersectionality, the idea that we um, have a, a number of different identities. We're not just our gender or our race or our sexual orientation or our ability status. We're all those things. Um, using people first language, um, using plain language, which you'll see in the accreditation standards. Um, of course, social determinants of health, um, the idea that of weathering and allostatic load for clinicians who are uh, working with patients, clients, members, uh, whatever term you use, the person receiving services. Um, and so um, I just want to put it out there that this is really important to understand these concepts and terms. And the Health Equity Council, uh, when we met, we believed that it was very important to come up with what we endorsed as um, defining definitions. There are many different definitions, for example, of health equity and so forth that we looked at. Um, and we decided on, um, you can go to the next slide, um, to endorse a couple of key definitions. Again, understanding there's many terms and uh, definitions to understand. Um, so we identified the term of minoritized as, a, as opposed to minorities. You know, in another probably 20, 25 years, uh, people of color will actually represent the majority of individuals in the United States. Um, recent uh, surveys show that uh, about 20% of Gen Zs identify as uh, LGBTQ+. Um, and so in some venues, uh, the term minority is actually not appropriate. And so we have endorsed the use of the term minoritized uh, instead of um, uh, minority. Um, also, sometimes when we talk, we uh, use the term historically marginalized or historically underserved. Um, those are also used. It depends on the individual and the setting. Um, and there's a number of different minoritized communities. These is the, Those that are listed, it's not an all-encompassing. So, for example, um, immigrants and migrants and so forth would also be considered. But these are just some examples. Um, and so the point here is that sometimes when folks think about health equity, they think of uh, racial inequity, which of course is front and center, but there are other health disparities that exist in our society and in the health system that impact these other uh, communities. Um, did you have a... Michael, I yeah, so the speakers know when I hop back on camera that I'm going to ask them something. Michael, one of the things I love about this slide here um, is the person first language. And I'm going to ask you for a minute just to talk about why that's so important. I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but I also know you can answer it. Sure. Uh, you know, the first time that I encountered the person first language was back in the late 80s and 90s when individuals with AIDS used the term people living with AIDS, people, people living with HIV. So the idea here is that you're a person first. One of your identities, whether you have AIDS or you are a, a member of a certain racial community or cultural community, um, is important. But first of all, you're a person. Um, and so and, and then um, uh, the people with disabilities community have also endorsed that kind of language. And um, what I say when I talk to my case management colleagues 
is uh, when you're working with an individual person, use whatever language they use to describe themselves. Um, so for example, with the LGBTQIA plus community, some people use the term queer to identify themselves as opposed to a gay man or a man who is gay or a woman who is gay. Um, and so just taking the cue from the member, patient, client, whatever term you use is important, but typically endorse the use of the, the term uh, people first language, um, which is really important to um, acknowledge someone as first a human being and, and and particularly in those that deal with individuals with different diseases or um, conditions um, that we would say people with diabetes as opposed to diabetics or asthmatics, people with asthma. So uh, it may feel like a nuance, but I think it's really important to make sure that we're not boiling people down to just a medical condition or a racial category or a sexual orientation. Absolutely. And we see it in the mental health space too, persons, persons who um, with mental health illness person. So we, it's just even using that and that sensitivity instead of saying you are defined by whatever this is. You are, I love that, that you are a person first. You're a community member first. You may be a parent. You may be your profession first, but it's all just part of that as you talked about the multiple identities. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to offer, obviously for the audience, you guys can give feedback as you want and you can ask questions and we're going to do our best to get to all the questions that come in. Um, but also know the speakers know that I'll interrupt them with their great question here. Great. And uh, the other important point with this definition is to make sure that people understand that um, the health disparities that exist are due to systemic or structural issues that exclude uh, people from access to care, access to housing, access to food, uh, whatever the issue is. So it's not the individual's fault as opposed to a systemic or structural issue that they're facing. So at this point, Oh, and health equity. Thank you. Um, health equity. Uh, again, we we looked at a lot of different definitions of health equity. I don't think any of them are wrong. Um, the reason I like this definition is the phrase continual process. So one of the things also, I think with this accreditation, and, and Jen, I may be going off script here a little bit, but with health equity accreditation, it's not a checklist approach. Um, like done this, done this, done this. It's really changing the culture of the organization. So it's not just a bunch of policies and procedures, but really demonstrating how have you changed your own internal culture for your own employees, actually, as well as for the members, patients, or clients, whatever term you use. Um, so, um, so anyway, so that's why I like this definition because it's an ongoing process. Um, Jen, go ahead. Yeah. So and. Uh, to Michael's point, um, you know, we recognize that um, health equity is an initiative that is based on your patients, your clients, your subsect of population. And so, yes, the the health equity the health equity program was written very broadly to allow the organization throughout the entire organization to have a commitment to the strategies and initiatives that are going to be the most impactful for the patients and the population that they're serving. Yeah, and, I, and also tying the last slide to this slide, um, I see some organizations have certain focus populations based on their own data analytics, um, which the accreditation standards allow for. So when I show that last slide with all the different potential communities, it's really up to the organization to figure out what's the focus going to be. Is there a particular community or um, a group of individuals that you're going to focus on? So the idea here, actually, this also incorporates the idea that equity is not the same as equality. Um, equity is really about uh, understanding the needs of the individual in the community and then um, removing barriers to allow for access to care and improve the experience and clinical quality uh, of the care. So at that point, I'm going to turn it over um, for the next portion with Lawrence. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, and also thank you for that uh, great definition and, and overview of key concepts uh, and terms to, to remember when we're talking about health equity uh, and, and when we're talking about different communities. I wanted to uh, give us a little bit of the public health perspective. Uh, and if you can go to the next slide, I'll introduce myself. Uh, so uh, like, my, like my colleague said, I am uh, Lawrence Haynes. I am currently the program manager uh, for racial equity at the American Public Health Association. 
Uh, so I am uh, I lead and, and support many of our health equity uh, programs and portfolios for our association and our membership. Um, I'm also trained as a as a as a therapist, a mental health counselor. Uh, I'm a member of the URAC Health Equity Committee, so I've been involved uh, very closely with um, uh, coming up with these these standards and and really making sure that you know the public health perspective is is considered. Um, and also for any folks out there that are current students, uh, especially HBCU uh, students or graduates, I am a PhD student at Howard University. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, like I said, I wanted to really just, you know, give a little overview about why this health equity accreditation is so important and, and why APHA, we believe in this accreditation. Uh, my colleague Michael gave a good uh, overview of some of the key terms and concepts that it's, it's important to remember when we're thinking about health equity. Uh, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, just really getting folks to understand what is public health and how does health equity uh, play into what we do in public health. And the first thing that I think it's important to remember uh, is, is what, what's the difference between health care and public health. There's a lot of overlap in these things, but there are some distinct differences. And I think the best way uh, to, to remember it and the best way to think about it is to think about healthcare. And I think most of us in this in this room right now would fall more on the healthcare side, but uh, you know, healthcare as an industry, it, it treats people who are sick, right? Um, now that's a very, very high level, very plain language definition. Uh, but if we're thinking about healthcare as an industry treating people who are sick, public health really aims to prevent people from getting sick in the first place or getting injured in the first place. So we're looking at, you know, what are some of those factors and what are some of those things that are bringing people into the healthcare industry? What are some of those things and what are some of those factors that might be requiring people to access healthcare, but might be getting in the way of being able to access those systems in, uh, in, in the healthcare industry? Uh, and to, uh, Another thing that's important to remember, and Michael touched on this uh, during his uh, discussion about definitions and, and concepts, is that public health really focuses on entire populations, while healthcare in many ways you know, focuses on individuals. What are some of the disease processes that's affecting this individual person uh, versus what are some of the trends and patterns that we're seeing across whole groups of people um, so that's a good thing to remember. And if you can go to the next slide, then we can start really diving into why, uh, you know, the health equity accreditation is so important as it relates to public health, but really as it relates to health equity in general. And I think you remember Michael kind of touched on these different concepts. And one of them uh, was the social determinants of health. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to really dive just a little bit deeper into what we mean when we say the social determinants of health. So on the left side, it says, what goes into your health, right? We know uh, certain things like your health behavior is a big part of, of your overall health status. So a few things, you know, are you, are you a smoker? What's your tobacco use, your level of diet and exercise, uh, your, your alcohol use? What's your sexual activity, your sexual behaviors like? Uh, then we also know that your environment, the physical environment in which you live, is a big part of your health status uh, and, and your overall health in general. And then of course, at the bottom right here is that 20% uh, where we see uh, healthcare fall in. So this is your access to care. Do you have a doctor or a provider that's available in your community? Um, what quality of care are you receiving? But then when we think about all of that, there's this big proportion right here, it's 40%, that we call the socioeconomic factors. So many of these things that are beyond, you know, if you're a smoker or if you are, uh, what your level of diet and exercise is, but they are related nonetheless. So we know, turning, we know depending upon your level of education, that education level affects your health. We know your job status. Are you part-time? Are you full-time? Uh, are you temp? And so we know that that plays into uh, your 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 health. We know your family and so social support. What type of family do you come from? Um, you know, are you 
do you have a two parent household when or are you like me grew up with a single mother uh you know who didn't have access to health insurance and these types of things what your income level is is so important in determining your ability and your access to different uh, systems within the healthcare industry and then even your community safety what does safety look like in your community and the figure next to it dives a little bit deeper into some of those some of those things that um, can 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 relate to either adverse or, or better health outcomes. So when we think about economic stability, your employment, income, your expenses, debt, medical bills, when you think about your neighborhood or your physical environment, housing, transportation, so on and so forth. And I see Lisa's coming on. So yeah, I mean, one thing that's not that's sort of like hidden in here a little bit um, is also the uh, did you grow up in a family where both parents spoke English? Right. Yes. Like, what does that were you the translator? Were you the um, you know, did your parents even know how to if things like, you know, my guess is most of the people on this call have college educations. But did your parents know how to help you apply for college versus did they not? Um, so, you know, my mother was an immigrant. It's like her parents did not help her apply for college. They were sort of like, why do you need college? Um, so even just that kind of extra space that you have and who taught you and what was the environment? Um, were parents involved? We talked about the early childhood effects. Were parents involved in school conferences? We talk about books in the household, all of those things. And yes, we will send out the slides and please do chime in in the chat box with your thoughts. Um, we're seeing the thoughts come in there with your questions. We're not going to open the phone lines because there are just too many of you, which makes me really happy. Uh, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. Can I go to your next slide? Uh, yeah, Lauren, sorry. No, yeah, you're fine. Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. Uh, so yeah, Lisa, appreciate that that point that you make. And I think it's really important to, to distinguish that, yeah, you know, really so many factors outside of what we really consider to be healthcare will inevitably impact your ability and your access to healthcare and your health status. I put this slide up here because I, I always love to uh, kind of zoom us out to so we can look at how these things show up really in our in our media, uh, how folks are talking about it. And this is just some headlines from different media uh, outlets that are really touching on the very things that we just talked about. So exposure to police violence linked to poor sleep in Black adults. We know that that's going to create some health disparity uh, and later on might create uh, more uh, deleterious health effects. What does health equity do about that? How do we start thinking about as healthcare organizations or associations, how can we start thinking about ways in which uh, the things that we do and the work that we do with patients or clients or populations might impact some of these things. Americans living without college degrees live shorter lives. Uh, your zip code might determine how long you live, how nature deprived neighborhoods impact the health of people of color, so on and so forth. Black women over three times more likely to die in pregnancy. Uh, why LGBTQ adults are more vulnerable to heart disease uh, for people in Clark County experience. So, you know, you start to understand and you start to see that in terms of health equity and also in terms of public health, having an accreditation standard that really outlines for the organization uh, and really, as Michael said, you know, changes the culture within that organization to really impact people beyond what the actual care or service that they might be receiving. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so health equity can touch many different healthcare organizations, and that is why accreditation is so important. And I really just wanted to put this here uh, because I know that we are in a group uh, room uh, with people within the healthcare uh, industry organizations. But now that you've kind of gotten a sense of the key terms and the concepts, and now that you've gotten a sense of all the different areas that health may impact, I challenge you to really expand uh, what you might consider uh, healthcare, what you might consider a healthcare organization. And also, to, I challenge you to expand uh, the different areas in which you and your own organization can impact some of these areas as you're considering health equity accreditation, as you're going through the different standards, really recognizing that um, health and health status is so much more than just, are we, do you, are you, you know, are you able to go to the doctor? Uh, what, how far away, you know, it impacts so many things that we may not consider to be, you know, health, uh, but are nonetheless uh, equity and are nonetheless uh, so important. And while we are here, you know, we we can be we can be open and honest about the fact that this stuff 
is it that popular? Is it all is it popular amongst everyone? This stuff causes some issues. And if you go to my next slide, I'll wrap up with just letting you know that, you know, another reason why health equity is so important is because there are uh, concerted efforts right now in the annals of power uh, to make it to where we can't do these things, to make it to where um, uh, a lot of these terms and a lot of these concepts that we've talked about today uh, are weaponized. And as we were able to see from uh, just all the conversation that we've had so far, uh, that if we are not able to talk about this, if we are not able to uh, address these issues that rise above just health care, uh, then we're really not going to be creating uh, and, and, and prioritizing equity, especially for the most marginalized people in this group. I think I'm turning it back over to Michael. Yes. Hey, hey, Lawrence, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is I want to tie the concept about structural systemic issues. Uh, for example, the environment that people live in that are in historically redlined neighborhoods mm -hmm. from the 19th and 20th century in this country um, show more pollution, uh, fewer, uh, less vegetation, fewer um, comprehensive grocery stores, fewer healthcare mm -hmm. clinics and so forth. And so that's an example of, you know, redlining has been gone for, I don't know, 60, 70 years, but the impact of that history has really impacted the individuals and communities that live in those areas. Um, so I, I just wanted to tie that together in terms of the social determinants of health. Also want to put a plug in for my niece who just graduated from Howard University last oh, year um, and is now in law school. And she had a wonderful experience at, at Howard. So uh, nice to see uh, another uh, colleague at, uh, at Howard there in D.C. Michael, I just want to give a shout out. Um, and I think, Lawrence, you touched on this, the zoning laws here, right? Like all of these things come in of like, where have people been allowed or not allowed to live? I mean, I remember my dad growing up in Philadelphia in the 1950s and saying Jews couldn't live above X Street. And like, that's not that long ago. Um, so thinking about that, thinking about like what neighborhoods and even transportation into what neighborhoods, what neighborhoods get bus lines, what neighborhoods get sidewalks, all of these things that go and, and who's involved there. Um, I could obviously talk with these uh, with Lawrence and Michael for hours about this here. But Michael, I'm going to let you go because I think what people really want to hear is where do I get started? And what are some examples here? Sure. Um, uh, no problem. You can go to the next slide. Um, so it is uh, noteworthy that unfortunately this month of April is also the anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think this is a really powerful statement uh, um, by him uh, nearly 60 years ago about um, the injustice to health is the most shocking and most inhumane of all in inequality. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so I am... Some folks may not be aware that um, health equity is an initiative really across all sectors in healthcare. Uh, many of you may be aware in this big bold there, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has the health equity framework. So those plans, Medicare Advantage plans, Medicaid managed care organizations, and uh, health systems and providers that um, provide a lot of services to Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and other um, services um, covered by CMS are clearly aware of the, um, or should be aware of the CMS uh, fr framework for health equity, but really all sorts of different sectors. The American Medical Association has a huge initiative. They also have inclusive language guidelines. The American Psychological Association uh, has a big initiative, um, and they also have inclusive language guidelines. The Association of, of uh, American Medical Colleges has their Center for Health Justice. They also have many different resources for clinicians, um, medical students, but also all clinicians um, for uh, services around health justice. Um, the uh, I already mentioned the National Minority Equality Forum, uh, Business Group on Health, the National Alliance of Healthcare Purchasers and Coalitions. Um, the Black Director's Health Equity Agenda is also a great resource. You can tell I'm a junkie in terms of, of um, uh, following and monitoring all these different initiatives across the spectrum, pharmacists, nursing homes, hospitals, and so forth. Um, and so I just want to make sure that people are aware, like, this is a growing initiative um, across all sectors um, in uh, regarding health equity. Um, so this is a way that I think about um, health equity. It, it, the um, 
Jen will tell you that that's not how the standards are organized, but they really touch on all of these areas. And the reason I think it's important to um, uh, have a slide like this is depending on where you're at in the organization, if you're a C-suite person or a senior leader or a board member, you're likely going to be uh, primarily interested in those on the organizational or macro level. Um, so do you have a DEI strategy? Do you have a chief diversity officer, a chief health equity officer? Um, do you have employee resource groups? Do you have a health equity strategy? Have you identified your focus populations? Do you have supplier diversity in place? Are your, um, is your website and apps compliant with the web content accessibility guidelines or WCAGs, which are internationally recognized for um, providing accessible communication with people with disabilities uh, and so forth? Um, so they, I think at the organizational level, you really set the stage for making sure that you understand health equity is important. Um, and um, in the standards, you'll see that uh, we ask, not we, the royal we, URAC asks for um, background information on uh, what kind of resources have you devoted to health equity and what's your strategy and what are you, folk, who are you, who, what individuals or communities are you focusing on? So that's at the organizational level. Uh, at the team level, so these would be, again, my, my hat is a case manager. So these would be like directors or, or supervisors of case managers and um, um, who then take these organizational strategies of how, what does that mean for my team? So one of the things it means is making sure that your workforce is diverse. Now, one of the um, ineffective strategies, in my opinion, has been that the focus initially um, for years has been on recruitment. So what happens is diverse uh, workers are recruited, but then they don't stay in the organization because the culture hasn't changed or they don't see um, uh, promotional opportunities or um, being on you know, key projects or whatever. And so what you'll see in the standards is we wanna see throughout the employee life cycle, uh, recruiting, hiring, orienting, learning and development, advancement, uh, mentorship, sponsorships and so forth, um, how you're incorporating that into your workforce um, and then um, learning and development. So we know that what's not effective is a one and done, check the box. We did one training on cultural competency. So our people are all trained up. Um, what I'm looking for from learning and development, and I'm sure Yurek is as well, is what's the ongoing continual uh, learning and development process. So one might be kind of broadly, what is health equity, but maybe focusing on um, specific presentations on health equity for um, people of color, LGBTQ plus, or veterans, or um, <clears throat> excuse me, or what have you. Um, so um, um, anyway, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. These are, these are not all inclusive lists, by the way. And then on an individual basis, when you're sitting across from the patient, client, member, whatever term that you use, um, is your communication, um, the way I frame it, is accessible? So for people with uh, vision loss, hearing loss, limited English proficiency, um, is it understandable? Um, so have you established a reading grade level um, for your individuals? Have you um, um, adopted uh, inclusive language uh, guidelines? And then inclusivity in terms of the types of images and uh, wording that you use in your communication materials. What kind of assessments are you doing? Are you assessing for social needs? Are you assessing for literacy, health literacy, digital health literacy, health insurance literacy? Depending on the, the work setting that you're at, there are tools out there for all those different kinds of aspects. And then also supporting the preferences and cultural beliefs. So you may have um, members, clients, patients who um, want to access um, non-Western medical practitioners, traditional medical practitioners. Um, and so are you open to that um, and uh, honor and respect those uh, preferences? So those are just a few examples on the individual level of working with um, members, patients, or clients. And so, yeah. Michael, um, I've asked people to chime in. If you haven't yet in the chat box, chime in to tell us what you're already doing. But I'm going to ask you a just like bare bones question. If an organization has not started on anything yet, what's kind of your one like quick piece of advice of like, if I could tell you to do something in the next six months, what would um, I tell you to do? Yep. Yeah, uh, you need to engage senior leadership in the board. That's mm -hmm. the first. Thing. Excellent. Because if you don't start there, 
all these other things are not going to work uh, because the organization has to see that yeah. this is a priority. So that may, and so how do you do that? So that may be if an organization has a predominant Medicare and Medicaid population, basically saying someone in the organization, uh, some leader, like, hey, CMS has this health equity framework. We better do something about this in order to be able to uh, optimize our work and, frankly, reimbursement with um, uh, CMS. It may be uh, an employer asking health plans. I, I scooted over that in terms of having inclusive benefits to support health equity. Um, it may be a benefits leader asking their um, uh, benefit providers, their health plans, their disability carrier, their dental carrier, their EAP, employee assistance program, uh, and what have you, their digital health solutions that they've incorporated. Uh, what are you doing around health equity and, and, and making that a priority? So I think it starts at the senior leadership, long answer to your uh, senior leadership and board, that mm -hmm. they're on board and they're going to support the initiative with resources and prioritization of health equity as important to the organization and for the individuals and communities that they serve. I'd love to hear in the chat box if that resonates with anybody else. Was it, you know, for your organizations, where did it start? Did it come from the top? Um, we see some organizations doing great things that have not if you're not quite there yet, Michael's just given you um, some ways to get started. And I think that's critical with that senior leadership of it's not driven. It's hard to integrate into culture. Um, you could have all your, you know, you can have your affinity communities. You could have your gaze of whatever, and they can have a book club and stuff. But is it, you know, where is the support coming from? Is it top down and meeting everybody? Where, where is it in the organization? Where is it across organizational culture? Mm -hmm. Jen, you're up next again to talk about this here. Oh, wait, Michael's got one more slide. Yeah, I just love this quote from Andre uh, Lord about it's not our differences that divide us. It's our, our inability to recognize, accept, and I love celebrate those differences. Um, so um, I think just it's a great um, segue into uh, Jen now going from the why it's important to uh, what the standards incorporate. For sure. Um, and thank you, Michael, for and, and Lawrence for going over all of health equity and again, helping us really get to a place where us at Iraq have uh, an understanding of health equity and how we can help the healthcare space continue to promote this. Um, so we're going to go through our health equity accreditation on a high level. Um, we're going to start with just some of the information about the health equity accreditation. Um, so everything that you're seeing on the left hand of the slide is really about the program itself and the structure um, of how we how we manage the program or how we run the program or what we've used to help develop the program. On the right hand side, you'll see the three different focus areas that make up the program and the program standards. Um, so we'll kind of start with the left hand side. Um, you know, we're very thoughtful in how we created our health equity accreditation program. We were very careful in making sure that we were not not creating this health equity program in a silo by ourselves without having the knowledge or the practice or the experience to be able to do that. Um, and so you saw earlier, we talked a lot about all of the individuals and organizations who really helped us develop this program. Um, we wanted a program that could recognize any healthcare organization who was working to promote health equity. Um, and, and who is creating strategies and initiatives to continue to eliminate disparities as well. Um, therefore, our accreditation is available to any healthcare organization. For us, this includes telehealth, pharmacy, case management, utilization management, payers, and so much more. We recognized that health equity impacts patients. And in order for us to really continue to promote and move forward health equity initiatives, we needed to allow any organization who is willing to take on this initiative, uh, be able to gain recognition for their, their own work and their own successes. Um, so it does take approximately six months to complete an application. Um, and organizations seeking this recognition do achieve a three-year accreditation. 
We also looked at a lot of different frameworks when we were developing this accreditation. Uh, you know, obviously CMS has their own framework around health equity. That was something that we looked at as we were developing these this program. And then also we looked at CLASS, which is the culturally and linguistically appropriate standards and pulled in some of those principles as well. Um, we've even taken these standards and compared them across state initiatives in health equity, and we see a lot of overlap in the um, in what we have on our side as requirements and standards and things that they are promoting and initiatives that they would like to see continue to move forward. So, you know, really what where we got to is equitable care is quality care. We are a quality care healthcare accreditor. Um, so we we really saw that there was alignment not only with what was happening in the industry and the areas that we were really trying to promote, um, but also, you know, we it aligned with a lot of our beliefs, our initiatives, and our practices. Um, so and a lot of what Michael talked about in the very last section where he was talking about going from a high level all the way down to the individual level. Um, it, it did get taken into our standards, not in the exact framework and the exact structure that Michael talked about. Uh, but you know, we, we said the most important thing here is organizational commitment. So what Michael was talking about top down, uh, this program, these program standards take health equity through the organization. It requires the entire organization to be committed to the strategies, the initiatives, and the, the overarching goal of health equity. Um, we also require organizations to create a program plan, really looking at, you know, how are they going to achieve this lofty goal of health equity, recognizing that it's about the process, the process of looking at your population, looking at who you're servicing and identifying strategies, and then being able to come back and identify whether or not those strategies are working. Um, and then there were very specific services and supports that we required that we required to be equitable. Um, so this is really the makeup of the program and where we landed. Um, we, you know, like I said, we did compare this to the CMS framework and we used the CMS framework in helping us develop these standards. So uh, we, you know, pulled together a quick slide that just kind of showed some of our high level work of where we uh, in UREC standards kind of met some of those priorities or, or helped promote those priorities that were in CMS's framework. Um, you know, if you look at, for example, specifically language access, we have standards around providing language assistance services or promote and promoting health equity and making sure that appropriate services are or uh, services are culturally appropriate. Um, whereas if you're also looking at the assessment side, um, you know, really making sure that you are assessing population needs and community assets and implementing interventions that are driven based off of those assessments and what your population is. Uh, so, you know, you will receive these slides as well as the webinar at the end. I'm not going to read this to you. Um, this is just our high level approach of what, uh, how we align with CMS. Um, and then we wanted to go through a little bit of eligibility here. Again, our, or our accreditation is open to so many different organizations within healthcare. Um, we're really looking for those who are providing health services and promoting health equity um, and, you know, demonstrating an integration of health equity principles throughout their organization. Um, we, we really want to see that those are recognized, and that's why we, we created this program. Um, the one thing I will say is you must have established self-monitoring practices um, emphasizing quality assurance and improvement. So, you know, make sure as much as having these strategies, these initiatives, these plans in place, um, that's step one. We also want to see that there is a mechanism for coming back and looking at that and where can you continue to improve and, and continue along the journey of health equity. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to pass it over to Deanna. Um, who can kind of take us through just next steps for anybody who's here. Thanks so much, Jen. And um, really thank you for kind of setting the stage and um, recapping that the program is meant for 
all across, so health plans down to PBMs and um, letting everyone just kind of understand that our, our focus is to encompass a, a diverse, as many diverse organizations as we see on the call. So um, I'm really happy to see a lot of teams on the call that I've already had conversations with. Um, this was really helpful for Michael and Lawrence to come on and, and share what they've had. And um, just wanted to kind of recap and say that if there's a need um, for me to contact you directly, I think Lisa's going to put up a poll um, so you can answer that and I'll reach out to you directly. Um, if we've already had conversations, I'll be following up with, with everyone post webinar and uh, feel free to just ask any questions um, back to me as needed as you guys kind of take everything back and do your gap analysis and uh, start going through different standards. We're here to help and serve serve in that space for you as a resource. So um, we have had some fantastic conversations. There's been a lot of great sharing of resources. Um, and I hope you all are leaving this with just sort of like, where do I start? What do I do? And how, how can I really showcase um, the work we're doing? Or how do I even get started? So maybe you're not quite there yet. And that's okay. Um, we know that equity initiatives take time. And we know that different organizations go through them at different pacing. It sometimes depends on your workload. It sometimes depends on what type of healthcare you provide. Equity is going to look different for a health plan versus for an IRO versus for a pharmacy um, versus for telehealth and digital health. So in digital health, um, we might see examples in Chime, and if you're seeing this here, of things like having translation services on demand on your telehealth services. So person can just connect in, ask if they need a translator, and they're there. Health plan, it might look like setting materials in multiple languages. It might look like just how are you evaluating treatment? Um, so we know this looks different. I want to give um, a thanks to, especially thanks to Michael and Lawrence for here. I want to give an opportunity for any last questions. I am going to close that poll because I think I've gotten most people responded there. Um, thank thank you, you to everyone who did. Michael and Lawrence, you guys can come back on the screen here. Jen and Deanna, thank you so much um, for being being on here with us. It was an absolute pleasure to work with you. I told them they were off duty for the chat box and they actually both chimed in with great resources. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, follow us on our website. You can follow us on LinkedIn. Um, Lawrence said, connect with me, uh, which we will happily do. And I'm going to officially, Michael and Lawrence, any last words here? Nope. No, thanks to everyone to make this a priority to attend. This so was... This was great here.